Good afternoon. As president of the University of Louisville Student Government Association, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to the State of the University Address. Now in its 10th year, the State of the University Address has established itself as an important tradition. It is our hope that this tradition will continue for many years to come. Today is an opportunity for the president to highlight this community, the successes we've shared in the past year, and our plans for the future for this outstanding university. The university has made tremendous strides in many areas, ranging from a significant growth in funded research to a remarkable change in the quality of our incoming students. Earlier today, we dedicated the Anne and Jim Bowling quiet study floor in Ekstrom Library. This newly furbished space is a great space for students needing a quiet place to study or work on a paper. We are delighted that Anne Bowling is with us in the, in the audience tonight. We are also honored that a number of other distinguished individuals have joined us for this special occasion, including members of the trustees, foundation, overseers, and alumni association. Also on the stage this afternoon are the winners of the 2013 President's Distinguished Faculty Awards. It is now my privilege to present to you the President of the University of Louisville, Dr. James R. Ramsey. Good afternoon. Thank you, Carrie. First, I want to thank you for choosing to attend the University of Louisville, and second, for your leadership at the University of Louisville. Would you join me in thanking Carrie for all that she does for the University of Louisville? Today is September 11th, 2013. I know you join me in remembering what happened 12 years ago and those who lost their lives on that day. This week marks the 10th anniversary of the State of the University ceremony. We began the State of the University as a new tradition to celebrate the energy and the enthusiasm we feel with the start of a new fall semester. But we also use the State of the University ceremony to reflect on the history and tradition that is the University of Louisville and how our achievements from the previous year add to that history. Today I start with a question that I've asked a lot lately and that is, isn't it a great time to be a Cardinal? We all know of our once-in-a-lifetime athletic successes of the past year, the only school to win a bowl championship football game. We were national champions in men's basketball, competed in the College World Series in baseball, and runner-up in the women's Final Four, all in one year. Yes, our athletic successes are well known. Radio and television have sports programs dedicated to reporting athletic news. Our newspapers have a sports section. Unfortunately, TV, radio do not have an academics time slot, nor the newspaper an academic section. So often what is not as recognized nor appreciated are the equally, perhaps even greater, academic achievements that have taken place at the University of Louisville in recent years. For example, last fall we began our fall semester by saying again that we had the best academically prepared freshman class in the history of the University of Louisville. And then we finished the year in June, late June, at the Louisville International Airport welcoming home our victorious world champion Cardinal Singers from their tour of Vietnam and Korea. Now, as an aside, let me just note that the academic profile of this year's incoming freshman class is even better than last year's freshman class. And while the Cardinal Singers were ranked number two in the world last year, we believe that when the next ranking comes out in February, based on our success in Vietnam and Korea, there's no question who will be number one in the world. While the state of the university has been a time to celebrate our achievements, it is also a time to
to recommit to our future. In her 2009 State of the University address, Dr. Willingans was prophetic as she weaved through her remarks not only the amazing achievements of the prior year, but the challenges or unknowns lurking in the swamp as she used the analogy from the epic poem Beowulf. Indeed, we have been challenged over the last several years, and these challenges and an uncertain future have unfortunately become the new norm for higher education. We don't need to spend much time discussing our financial challenges. We all know about the recession of 2008 and 2009 and know that it was the most difficult economic time in our history going back to the depression of the 1930s. We understand tough economic times and that when Americans and Kentuckians lose their jobs, we should expect budget cuts. But we also understand that it is at these very times, these tough times, that we as an institution become even more critical to our community and to our constituencies. For it is our job and our responsibility to provide health care to the swelling roles of uninsured. It is our job to support social services provided to families in our neighborhoods most impacted by the recession. And of course, it is in these difficult economic times that the value of a college degree is reinforced. Let us not forget that the current unemployment rate for those with a college degree is half the rate for those with a high school degree. 3.8% for those with a college degree, 7.6% for those with a high school degree. Our physical challenges, though, have been more than state budget cuts. We teach in economics that markets are amazingly efficient and they are. So we've seen a rapid change in the marketplace for higher education, especially with the growth in asynchronous educational delivery models. Today we faced increased competition from proprietary institutions that are nimble and that take advantage of niche markets. The historical oligopoly-like position of public higher education institutions in the marketplace has been challenged by institutions that provide education any time, any place, and to anybody. We can talk about academic accountability, quality, and the value of on-campus educational experiences, but in recent years, we have indeed seen consumers of higher education voting with their feet. And the unknowns of the swamp have not been limited to financial and market impacts. We in the academy have unfortunately but rightfully, under attack for what we value most, our integrity. Without pointing fingers, or you know the stories. What happened at Penn State is for the courts to sort out and to assign responsibility. But we know that what happened there should never happen on a college campus. And we must ensure that it never happens at the University of Louisville. Other great academic institutions have struggled with issues that cast a shadow on the academy. What started at another great institution as a rogue assistant coach who apparently went too far in helping a student athlete remain athlete academically eligible soon evolved into an embarrassing revelation that it was just not student athletes who were taking courses of minimal content and rigor, but such courses were available to all students. The departure and immediate rehiring of the president of another great public institution and a large payout to still yet another president encouraged to resign for his after his feeble attempts at humor have appropriately raised issues about higher education governance. And the revelations of the numerous schools who have falsified data that has been submitted to U.S. News and World Report is sobering. These realities and others have caused the President of the United States to say it's time to shake up higher education. And the President has put a proposal on the table to more directly involve the federal government into the operations of the campus. Secretary of Education Duncan probably said it best when he stated that higher education is at a crossroads, required to choose between incremental and transformational change. Hence a paradox. While our education system is still the envy of the world, we are expected to get better and to do more. Ironic, isn't it, 
that at the very time policymakers question our accountability, affordability, effectiveness, integrity of the academy, the demands placed on the academy without corresponding funding grows daily. There are even some who want to rewrite our mission statements from one of providing a quality education that requires our students to think critically and to think logically and to be able to reason and communicate to one where our campus is evaluated and perhaps funded based on our graduate starting salaries. Some in our broader community look for us for specific widget making skills while overlooking the reality that real long-term economic growth results from the investment in human capital, brain power, creativity, entrepreneurship, for this is what powers our economy in this global and changing world. Still, we accept the expectation placed upon us and understand that we must be the drivers of the economy, providers of improved health care, and engaged in the daily life of our community. For it is this work that we do that is critical to addressing the issues holding back our community and state. So, so we as an institution must face the facts. The perception of the academy and the expectations of the academy have changed. And these perceptions, expectations will not end when all who've lost their jobs during the recession are back at work and our economy has improved. Now, in fact, we at the University of Louisville have recognized these facts, so let's give ourselves some credit. We have long understood that for us to achieve our statutory mandate, we could not be successful by merely doing what we've done in the past. So we've picked the low-hanging fruit to become more efficient, implementing $114 million in cost savings. But we've done more. We've tackled some tough issues. Our attempts to increase clinical income so that we can continue to provide the very best health care to all, the very best health care to all in our community, regardless of, of, of income, was faced with political, ethical, and market challenges. But we did not relent in finding a partnership that positions us well for the future. We also did not back away from the recognition that our clinical private practice plans were based on a historical model that at one time was reasonable and made sense. But with changes in healthcare, a different approach had to be taken, and that's what we're doing. As an institution, we understood long before the recession that we must focus not only on generating more revenues and controlling cost, but we must also better manage our balance sheet. So our initiative to ensure all assets of the university are fully performing are paying dividends. Despite opposition in our community, we've planted the seedlings that will bear fruit, financial fruit, to the university in the years ahead. So let the record show that we've done the obvious and we've tackled some tough issues. And as a result, we're on an amazing academic trajectory, a trajectory of which we are proud. And we recognize that this trajectory has been accomplished on the backs of our faculty and staff. Our faculty and staff who had received only two recurring salary, salary increases in the last six years. Our faculty and staff who've not seen their supply budgets increased in well over a decade. Dr. Willingan said it may have actually been two decades since we've had an increase. And a faculty and staff who've not had new colleagues to work alongside of as we've not been able to fund new faculty positions that are called for in the 2020 plan. To you, our faculty and staff, we say thank you for your work and your efforts in allowing, this, allowing us to achieve this amazing trajectory. And yes, you, our students, have also paid a price, increased tuition to make this trajectory happen. But we now face the reality that there is still more to do. More is expected of us. So our Board of Trustees came together at their 2012 summer retreat, which was held on our Shelby campus, to face the hard reality that while we are indeed on an amazing trajectory, and we are exceeding expectations in an era of budget cuts, we must do more to meet our statutory mandate. As a result, during the last year, 
We held faculty and staff forums. We listened. We put difficult issues on the table. We began to address cultural and other issues that hold us back. Our forums were open to all, from professors to physical plant. Second, we performed an independent SWOT analysis that allowed us to identify our strengths, but identified openly for all to see our weaknesses and those things that we as a campus must do better. Finally, we began a campus dialogue led by the provost, a dialogue that we called for last year in our State of the University address and appropriately entitled the University of the 21st Century. For being a university of the 21st century is what is expected of us and what we must be for our community, our region, and our state to thrive. Then at the board's recent 2013 summer retreat held at our new nucleus building, Dr. Willingantz, along with the trustees who participated in this initiative throughout the spring, outlined our next steps for moving forward. There are four steps. First, we must finalize our plan for enhancing and enriching scholarship, teaching, and research to include new and innovative, collaborative, and multidisciplinary concentrations, concentrations in which investments of significant resources will be made. These concentrations will build on our existing institutional strengths and will be the areas where the University of Louisville will be recognized nationally and internationally. Our preliminary discussions during the spring identified nine potential areas of excellence. But as Trustee Joe Steffen reminded the Board of Trustees this summer, the curriculum belongs to the faculty, a fact that we recognize and we support. So in the days ahead, more discussions, more dialogue will take place with the campus community to finalize these multidisciplinary areas of excellence that shall define the University of Louisville. And at the same time, we must identify fund sources for making needed investments in the university. Such sources will include the investments being made by Kentucky One, philanthropic opportunities, revenues from our tax increment financing districts, and existing unrestricted funds of the foundation. But perhaps our greatest funding opportunities come from change in our business practices and how we operate the university. We must invest. New dollars are required. And we cannot expect the state to be the source of all of these new funds. Second, we must ensure that we are globally engaged, accessible, and student-centered university. As one of our trustees pointed out this summer, during their committee discussions back during the spring, the focus was often on faculty and staff, not students. To be a university of the 21st century, we must be student-centered, which means addressing the learning opportunities available to our students. Third, in our SWOT analysis, some of our strengths were also identified as weaknesses. Our SWOT analysis reminded us that there are divides on campus. We were told that the most divisive issue on campus is in fact the debate over distance education and alternative educational delivery models. While our athletic program is a great strength, the athletic business model is very different from the business model of the Belknap campus. But then again, the business model of the Health Science campus is different from that of the Belknap campus. The diversity and decentralization that exists on our campus is part of the history of the University of Louisville. It is a strength, but it also at times holds us back with a culture of haves and have-nots, and with the attitude by some on campus that it's okay to be good rather than a requirement or an expectation that we be great. We're also told that there are those on our campus who feel a lack of trust in the institution due to the perceived and real inequities that exist. And we often also see a lack of entrepreneurial, risk-taking culture on our campus. It is time to address these issues head on. We also understand that a fear of failure is one of those unknowns in the swamp, a fear that keeps us from changing from the past. But we cannot be an organization that is 100% risk averse. We know that we will not always be successful. We will stumble, 
but we cannot fear failure. Rather, we must learn from this, these experiences and move forward. Fourth, the complex and changing physical environment of recent years provides us with stark reality. Public funds for higher education are not the panacea. We cannot, nor should not, blame the state. In the years since the recession, in the pecking order of priorities, higher education has not been the top, at the top of the list. This means that not only must we continue with our seven strategies for moving forward in a tough fiscal environment, but we must do more. As stated, fundamental, systemic change is required in many of our business operations. Existing structures and the organization of how we do our business must be reviewed, analyzed, and where appropriate, changed. I believe this should be our highest priority we must complete this task immediately. Going forward, resources must be allocated strategically for the strategic investment and prioritization of resources is critical if we're to be a university of the 21st century. Those were the recommendations that were approved by the board this summer for us to continue to work on as we move forward. Are we yet? Are we there yet with the answers, the solutions, the details? No. But we have restarted our discussions this fall and our dialogue to determine the detail of each of these four board adopted recommendations. We realize that these discussions will be hard, but this is what we must do. A fair question to be asked is why should we do this? One might say it's unreasonable to continue on our trajectory given the challenges, financial and other, that we face. First, we must embark on being a university of the 21st century because it is the right thing to do. Second, change will happen. We know the academy. We know what it values. We should be the ones that drive the change, not federal bureaucrats or others from outside the academy. Finally, our University of the 21st Century Initiative, I believe, offers us the best hope for providing the resources that are critical to supporting your work, the work of our faculty and staff. I believe the rewards can be great for all of us with bigger and better research portfolios comparable to those of our future peers in the ACC. I believe this path will even mean stronger academic programs and that this path will provide us a hope for the resources that we need to continue. One could also ask, what is there to cause us to think that we as a campus community can be successful? First, look at what you've already accomplished. Pardon my language, but it's damn near amazing that in a time of 13 budget cuts, our graduation rate has increased from 30% to 52%. It's amazing that we're graduating 1,000 more undergraduates now than we were a little over a decade ago. We've doubled the number of PhD graduates over the past decade. And while we know the many, many changes, both internal and external, our research funding is five times greater today than it was at the beginning of the Post-Secondary Education Reform Act of 1997. And far, far more important than any of these numbers, we know that your work your teaching, your research, are providing for a better quality of life for the people of our community and state. And on a personal note, in 2010, I made a promise. I made a promise to the campus community that we will improve our research infrastructure to support you, our faculty, so that you can be more successful. We're not there yet, but we'll keep trying and we'll get it right. So we can be successful in the future because we have a track record of success. Do not underestimate what you, the University of Louisville, have done and the power we have as a campus community. Do you remember January 2nd, I believe it was, the Sugar Bowl, the talking heads on, <laughs> the talking heads on ESPN said that the University of Louisville didn't have a chance against the University of Florida. Do you remember March 31st, 2013, the U of L women's basketball team playing Baylor? 
again, we were, it was said that we did not have a chance, but we won. A win proclaimed to be the greatest upset in women's college basketball history. Joni Schemmel believed. Yeah. Shoney believed. Her teammates believed. They believed that they could win. So let others underestimate the University of Louisville but let us never underestimate what we can do. Second, we have a roadmap. We know what needs to be done. It is a path that will be tough, but practically, what are our other options? We could throw in the towel, discard the 2020 plan, and say we're content to be where we are. But is that what we want, to settle for second best? Or perhaps we could continue with the 2020 plan with our heads in the sand and hope that we get lucky and like manna from heaven the state showers us with new funds. <laughs> yeah, you got that right. We've got to be realistic. As one of our trustees said at our 2010 summer retreat at Fort Knox, when an outside consultant was making a presentation with regard to the goal for our capital campaign, the consultant said a university an institution like the University of Louisville can probably raise $600 million as part of a capital campaign. And that trustee said, wouldn't we rather strike out in the major leagues than hit a home run in the minor leagues? And so our campaign goal was set at $1 billion, not $600 million. And today we're at $890 million and still counting. Coming together as a campus, we will be successful. Third, never has our community or our state needed the University of Louisville more. Read the recent economic impact analysis of the University of Louisville by independent economist Mano Shanker of what we mean to this state. In FY 2013, the overall impact of the University of Louisville on the Commonwealth of Kentucky was $1.7 in economic output. In FY 2013, U of L had direct and indirect employment of 20,714 people. For every in person employed at the University of Louisville, two people are employed as a result of our work in the community at large. Manoj concluded his report by saying that, to put in perspective, U of L's output grew during 2013. The uh, the um, uh, academic year in the fiscal year by 4.9 percent while gross state product grew by 3.2 percent. And we observed for many years that the only crane showing construction activity in downtown Louisville was that of the University of Louisville in our nucleus project. Finally, if we do not lead, who will? For we are, we are the institution that thrives on first who was the leader in the implementation of the Post-Secondary Education Reform Act of 1997. Which campus developed campus diversity plans years before we were required to do so by the CPE? Who did the other universities wait on to be the first to provide health insurance for domestic partners? Which campus, when challenged by the Louisville Arena Authority, to be the first to follow their minority and female hiring practices said we will. Who time and time again has picked up the mantle of partnership in our communities to ensure the success of UPS and other businesses? Who was there working with the Jefferson County Public School System to develop a clinical model of teacher education, one of the first such models in the nation? Who stepped up to partner with Simmons College of Kentucky to meaningfully address the education gap in our community, and which university always puts what is best for the people of Kentucky first. It's time to get going. Again, I say it will be a challenge, but it will be an amazing and exciting opportunity 
an opportunity for us as an institution and an opportunity for us as a people. There'll be days ahead when we'll be discouraged, but on those days, let's remember what we were told several years ago by focus groups from across the community when they were asked to describe what the University of Louisville means and what it stands for and what it represents. We were told then that the University of Louisville stands for having the courage to question convention, the passion to break new ground, the insight to champion community, the imagination to pursue the undiscovered, the will to achieve greatness, the promise of a limitless future, and the people to bring it to life. Yes, we have the people to bring it to life. So let's get started. Well, let's first beat Kentucky on Saturday, but then... <laughs> but let's continue then on this journey, this amazing trajectory. Thank you. Thank you, President Ramsey. We'd like to conclude this year by showing a video. It's an old video. It's the Charting Our Course video that we developed when we began the capital campaign. And I think we decided to show this video because every once in a while, it's really good to remember that what we do matters. We often talk a lot about what, and we forget about why. And the why is because what we do makes a difference in our students' lives. The why is because what we do is healing people in our community. The why is because what we do is developing economic development that puts us in a leadership role for quality of life in this community. And the why is because, as Dr. Ramsey said, if we don't lead, who will? So with that said, thank you all for coming today, and let's hope the video works so that we can all watch it. <laughs> I am absolutely driven to help this community move forward because it's my home. We're making the city of Louisville a better place. What I saw here was an opportunity to do a great deal of good for kids that grew up exactly the way I did. I did not know how I was going to pay for college. It was just a big question mark in my future. It's really hard to understand how people with paralysis suffer every day. And right now, we have knowledge that we can translate to ease that suffering. We have an undereducated population in not only Louisville and Jefferson County, but in Kentucky. You know, stakes are really high for us right now. Uh, we live in a global economy. We've got competitors tomorrow that we haven't even thought of today. In a hyper-competitive environment, you really can't afford to make any mistakes. A great university is really characterized by the people who are there, and a great university has to have great students. To offer that quality education, it takes money, and it often takes money that our students don't have. So some of what we're hoping to do in this campaign is raise money for scholarships. My name is Nicole Wilkins, and I'm the first graduate of the Cardinal Covenant Program, which was a program that gave me the opportunity to go to UofL and get a quality education. My experience at UofL and being able to attend UofL was amazing. It was a life-changing opportunity for me. Growing up in Crofton, everybody around here goes to the factory as soon as they graduate high school, if they do get to graduate high school and don't get their GED, or they go to the Army or the military right out of high school, and that's about as far as they go. To go to a school that's willing to invest the money to help you get your education is a big deal. It means that they're willing to take a risk in a sense that these students are going to turn out to be quality scholars and quality alums. We're a people's university. We're, we're a citizen's university. We're here to help the people of our community and state. My name is Marcus Blakeney. I am a senior Porter Scholar. The availability of the Porter Scholarship to the African American community means students have the opportunity to come to a four-year institute here at the University of Louisville and achieve any type of degree program that they choose in their undergraduate career. 
The Porter Scholarship really relieves a lot of stress from a lot of students. Without the funding for the Porter Scholarship, I definitely would not be here. My name is Susan Harkema. I'm a researcher and a faculty member in the Department of Neurosurgery. People with spinal cord injury suffer every day. They live with challenges that none of us can imagine. We have unveiled some new mechanisms that were never understood before. And there's a tremendous opportunity here that rarely comes in a scientist's career. We now have the opportunity to change the face of rehabilitation. Our frustration is that we don't have the resources needed to refine the technology and move this knowledge into a clinical setting. We realized that there was a part of our community that had been left behind. And it had been left behind economically, socially, didn't have the very best in healthcare, been left behind educationally. And so we've created our signature partnership initiative. We designated five schools as our signature partnership schools that we're going to work with. And J.B. Atkinson is one of those schools. Dewey Hensley, I'm the principal of Atkinson Elementary. When I first arrived, Atkinson was the lowest performing school in Kentucky. The average income when I first got here was $12,400 per family. So there was a great deal of poverty that characterized this school and all the baggage that comes with that. What we've been able to do is pool together enough resources and wonderful people through our signature partnership with the university to make good decisions and figure out exactly what we need to do. So we've been able to leverage the Kent School of Social Work. We have brought the School of Nursing in. We certainly have leveraged the School of Education and brought in their expertise. While most schools would be happy to have two or three Louisville Writing Project teachers in their building, we have 13. That has led to us having the largest jump in writing in the state's history. In one year, we had a 55-point jump in our writing performance. Kids from poverty can learn. All they need is the right instruction. All they need is to be surrounded by caring adults that will love them even when they don't love you back. Chuck Denny, Regional President of PNC. It's critically important now to give to the University of Louisville. U of L is the engine that drives change in our community. We have got to feed that engine and provide it with the resources it needs to be exceptional. The dollars, the resources, the passion, the interest that we invest in the University of Louisville will return to this community a hundredfold. The university has some pretty huge dreams right now. And the dream is to really make the world a better place. And we believe we can do it. But we don't believe we can do it alone. We believe that every gift and every friend and every person who helps us is making us a better place and making it more possible to make this the community the place that we all want to live in. We need our alumni, we need our friends, we need our supporters in this community to step forward and invest in not just the future of the University of Louisville, but more importantly, the future of this community and state.